This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Today's special guest is Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. Mr. Hager is the 36th Comptroller of the state of Texas, which makes him the state's chief financial officer, revenue estimator, check writer, tax collector, and economic barometer. So, welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Good to be back. You know, I don't know if you realize this or not, but you were the very first guest on the Trey Blocker show a little over a year ago. I didn't Beginning in 2017. That. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing so, how a year goes by. Pretty time quick, flies. Doesn't it? Yeah, time absolutely. flies. Uh, so thanks for coming yeah, back. Glad to be here. Uh, interesting thing to point out probably is when you came on and we did that first episode, I know I watched it. Uh, my mother probably watched it. You probably didn't watch it. Uh, so. It's good to have you back because we talked about some really uh, important topics right. that I'd love to cover again today yeah, because be now we're over 50,000 yeah, yeah. viewers and, and people are actually paying attention. So I would love the opportunity to educate them again okay. on what the Comptroller's Office does, what you do, uh, and what your objectives, priorities Great. are, and things of that sort. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Okay. Before we do that, let's talk about you. Okay. Sixth generation mm -hmm. Texan. Born and raised here yep. uh, from a farming family. That's right. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, so I grew up in a little community called Hockley, Highway 290. As you're going towards Houston or coming out of Houston, if you blink, you miss it. That's how big it is. However, now with all the growth of Houston, we're five miles from the Grand Parkway, the new loop around Houston, right across our western boundary. Got a little company that built a 90 acre under one roof project, so major distribution facility for uh, air conditioned units and the point being is all of a sudden your next door neighbor has 5,000 people going to work there every day. So uh -huh. we're not in rural Texas anymore, not right. like we were in the 1940, 1840s when my family got there or when I was growing up out there. But the family is still actively engaged in agriculture. I try to get out there a little bit, but obviously with a statewide position in the executive branch, it's really hard. But, you know, it was a great upbringing. Uh, one, it made me appreciate cooler weather. <laughs> uh, Texas humidity on the Gulf Coast is, whoo, well, it's hot. But with that being said, I mean, I, I really couldn't ask for a better upbringing because okay. it teaches you hard work. You get to spend, you know, a lot of all my summer days, spring break, Christmas, and I'd be working over the holidays, obviously not Christmas, but, you know, an opportunity to, to be outdoors, which is what I love, mm -hmm. and uh, to, to learn hunting and fishing and all those fun things that we value here in Texas. So it was a great upbringing overall, and, and I really wouldn't go back and change any part of it, even though instead of a 105 degree temperature in August, you'd hope maybe it'd be 90 degrees instead. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure you thank the good Lord for air-conditioned tractor Oh cabins. my gosh, yeah, but, the, but <laughs> I tell you, in, the, in those days, uh, the worst thing was to have them and then when they broke, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. oh there's there's several days where I spent out there, and you know if you just even any office building you've been in, or, or if you get in a car right. here in Texas, you know get inside and just turn the AC off and let the hot air blow on you. Uh -huh. That thing is excruciating, right. and you go oh we'll just roll down the windows. Yeah, but there's a thing called dust and right. uh, lots of dust that just makes you itch and scratch. But you know again it makes you appreciate a lot of smaller things in life, which is which is your point. That's yeah. right. Well, I think it would be good if we could get every teenager, let's just say that, outside during the summer to work. Yeah, I'm, right? I'm gonna tell you seriously, whenever you uh, go through that type of work environment, and, it, and it's hard work, and it's hot outside, but you appreciate anything else after that. And I think, um, you know, and I've said that over and over, I mean, it taught me, you know, the value of hard work, taught me integrity, you know, and honesty, just the way the family dealt with business. Right. And, you know, those are kind of things I talk about as core values that I took away from that and try to implement in the public office in the, in the position of raising our three children, sure. you know, and try to implement that into your value system. Right, absolutely. So not too far up the road from you is Texas A&M mm -hmm. University where you decided to go to undergrad. Yep. What drew you to become an Aggie? 
That's one, obviously, uh, just kind of more of a school that had a little bit more of an agriculture background than, uh, than other schools, even though I didn't go into agriculture there. Uh, really, I was on a path to go to law school, but right. it seemed as though it was a good fit for Glenn Hager far as, again, kind of that, that core value system that, that A&M Nation holds dear to itself, and, and it ended up being a really good fit. And even though Dara, my wife, and I, we didn't meet there, we met in law school, a few years later, she's an Aggie as well, and so she's real involved on the alumni board. So it's a good value system for both of us. And then now it's you know been great because we get to already uh, as good Aggies do indoctrinate the next generation. That's right. Before That's exactly they even right. understand what's coming along, <laughs> <laughs> they, they get used to that. Uh, oh that yeah. Colored yeah, jersey, they, they and don't, they don't they want don't, any other. They don't know anything else right now. It's kind of comical. <laughs> Uh, speaking of, uh, of your wonderful family, uh, have we talked about AM football yet? Your team's doing all right. Our team's doing okay. okay. You know, we, we, we lost to the number one team in the nation and the number two at the time. Yeah, but know, okay. but it's, uh, we get up there a fair amount with the kids. I mean, as, as you know, uh, my youngest daughter, so I've got a 13-year-old daughter, 10-year-old daughter, and 10-year-old son, and my right. youngest daughter is a sports fanatic. Right. I right. mean, and just uh, football Oh my gosh, I remember putting her to bed one night. She was like, I'm so glad tomorrow's Saturday. <laughs> and I was thinking I, under my breath and in my own mind, yeah, me too, so I can sleep late. And uh, before I said anything, she's like, because tomorrow's college football. And I was like, I didn't even realize football season started. You know, but it's just comical uh, how much excitement. So it's fun to be able to take them, you know, to a few games sure. or watch sure. them on TV and see. So at least, uh, yeah, it's a much better year than we've had in a few others. But usually it's this time of the year that things go south. So yeah, fingers we're crossed. keeping our fingers yeah. crossed. So Julia really is somewhat of a savant when it comes to yes. anything and everything, football, oh, even statistics, teams, correct. college, yeah. and in, oh, NFL, oh, correct? Just, oh, yeah. I mean, just the other day I was uh, took her up to her room to put her in bed, and I laughed uh, right beside her bed. She has a, a little magnetic uh, piece on her wall that has all the, the NFL teams. And every week she will re-rank them by division and one through four. And next to it was on her little, little uh, uh, countertop there. It had a sheet with all the NFL teams. And when we're in church, you know, we'll let the kids scribble. They got to right. listen and we'll l ask them questions later. But what does she always draw? It has something to do with NFL. Huh. has something to do with college every week, which is just pretty amazing. And we laugh. We were asking the kids, what are they going to be for Halloween? Which right. is, uh, you know, coming up here pretty soon this year. And Hey, I will laugh because the who did she decide to go as? Our head coach, Jimbo Fisher. <laughs> so uh, every moment she's how old and she's ten. Right. So uh, I was teaching. Her, I said, "You got to talk like this," because he's got that <laughs> accent. And so uh, we had a little bit of fun about that. Now, of all things, uh, she wants okay. to go as the head coach. But you know, hey. She could pick somebody that has a lower salary. I mean, at least she went high for a guy that makes seven point well, five million guaranteed go. a year. There you go. She's yeah. a smart kid. Exactly. Well, I think you need to record some video of her doing her impersonation when she gets it refined, <laughs> and then make that part of her application when so. she applies I to think A&M. So. That's years exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly great. right. Now her twin uh, Jonah is quite the hunter, and, yes. and the air is getting cool outside. So is he wearing his camo every day, uh, begging dad to not, take Not money? in the camo, but he's ready. So I got him. A new scope on his rifle and we went and shot it this last weekend and after uh i took my rifle too just to make sure it was on site and i told him i said oh my gosh your scope is better than mine <laughs> and he said oh but dad you can use my rifle anytime it's you very want generous to, which i thought was very yeah. kind of him oh yeah he's ready he's ready <laughs> so uh it's all good you know that's a fun thing i mean again kind of going back to the family farming operation is that you, you have something that was near and dear to me as a kid growing up mm -hmm. to be able to kind of pass that on to the next generation is, is a lot of fun and rewarding. Right, absolutely. So what is Claire into these days, your oldest? Oh, my oldest one, you know, a few years ago, she wanted to be an Olympic swimmer. So I think with my stature of 5'9", she's not going to be an <laughs> Olympic swimmer. But hopefully she's not watching the podcast because uh, she, she, I don't think she'll be there. And I don't want to bust her boba. Diving? Yeah, maybe, maybe so. So she's big into swimming. She loves band right now. You know, we haven't told her that when you become a freshman in high school next year, the two probably don't match up. Mm -mm, so, no. and I've tried to hint that when you, uh, at some point in time, something's got to fall off the map. But it, it's it's interesting at, at kids how we saw it when we were growing up and others growing up, how they have different interests. You know, right. and marine biology, which is just obsessed with with what goes on in weather, atmosphere, marine, which is really interesting, because uh -huh. you know, that wasn't my interest, but 
you try to take you try to change your interest to match with your kids so you kind of help uh, further yeah, them along a little bit which is yeah because you, you still want to be uh omniscient right yeah, you want right. to be the one who knows everything yes, so you yes, better be yes. one step ahead of what they're learning at least until right. they get 16 and then the, you're just as dumb no, as can be <laughs> that's true you can't stop no you can't no, stop that that's human nature that's right that's right so dara your absolutely wonderful wife yep. um Going back to talking about football, how how often has somebody told you you out punted your coverage, or oh out kicked your coverage? Oh my gosh, beyond beyond <laughs> capability. She is absolutely fabulous. No, I, I tell you, not that you, you're not great. No, I I tell people you know all the time. I mean, I'm just I'm blessed, and uh, I I kind of tell her and a few others. I'm just so fortunate I haven't screwed up my marriage somehow. <laughs> uh, you know, by saying something dumb or being gone too much with the politics or the travel. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things, just knowing that I married up is when I ran for office, I made two promises. And, and the first and foremost promise was to her that politics and me serving would never interfere with our marriage right. or when we have kids. Sure. And, and that's kind of been one thing that has kind of kept me focused just because you know, a little bit of a slip up and you, know, you, you change the direction. And so I'm fortunate, you know, she's awesome, she's fantastic. And, I just try to continue to make sure that I let her know that because <laughs> guys are not good. too good about that at all. Typically guys, not, no. guys are not good about it right. whatsoever. So, right. uh, yeah, I'm pretty fortunate without a doubt. Well, you are both very accomplished, busy professionals, so it, I'm sure that takes a lot of yeah, work. And, yeah. and uh, communication is important, as yeah, you've told right. me uh, yeah. all, uh, quite often. Uh, and that's that's important to keep it, keeping it all together. Yeah, I think I, I just think the key in so much in life, whether it's a good relationship, as in a marriage, dating, whether it's friendship, whether it is raising kids, work environment, mm-hmm. is just having a good communication line. Right. And and I think that, that solves a lot of problems. And and uh, I was thinking about it because I was on the road late last night for for a drive back to Austin from from a speech across the state. And so when it's late at night. You don't really get to talk to anybody in the car. And I was thinking back when we were dating. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a period of time where we just weren't communicating. And it was a rough patch. Right. And uh, when we were in law school, and I just remember I had said, hey, let's go out and have dinner. And, in fact, it was uh, La Madeline there in, in uh, San Antonio and Alamo Heights. And we made a pattern where we would go there if it wasn't every week or every two weeks. And we'd sit at almost the exact same table, have a very frank, honest conversation, you know, it was really cool because I was thinking about that last night, how after a while, we didn't have to go there anymore, hmm. you know, and we didn't have to have that because you were doing it regularly. Right. And, and it was kind of interesting how I really think that that's kind of a credit of kind of where we're at in our relationship, which will be 20 years marriage in December oh, of this wow. year. Congratulations. That it goes back to the kind of that open conversation. Sure. And I think we can all learn from that is my point. Yeah. Even whether it's in the building with, you know, 2,900 employees, 26 div- divisions, is just trying to have that line of communication. And in today's world, I just press upon my staff all the time. You know, people want to send uh, a text message. They mm. want to send an email. Right. When get up out of your chair and walk down the hall. Because right. someone's literally down the hall. And, you know, having there's that, a human being. There's down a there. human being. Right. And have, there are things that you may not want to say face to face that you're more emboldened to put in an, in an email mm. and or people don't understand the tone. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that communication translates beyond just a marriage is my point. Right. That's in the work environment too. Sure. And, and having that one-on-one, you can't replace that. Right. No doubt about it. So politics, yep. what, what got you interested? When did you first run and why? Yeah, I've always, I've always had an interest in serving for some reason. Can't explain it. It's always been uh, ever since I was a kid. You know, I felt like uh, either I was going to be involved in, in the family and agriculture, which, which I still am, but, but to a very minimal degree. <laughs> uh, my grandfather was a Baptist preacher, and I thought about that. But I thought, okay, well, it's kind of hard when you know you're pretty flawed as a human. How do you stand up and tell people? Uh, you need to be better when you know you're looking in the mirror to yourself. So I right. thought, well, maybe preaching's not in my... And I've always, which politics is kind of like preaching to some degree. True, um, true. But I've always had a desire to serve. And, and I told Dara when we were dating, I said, look, you know, I don't know if that opportunity will ever come. But if it does, I'd like to have that opportunity. Right. You know, at least try. And, and fast forward several years, family sold one of our businesses. I had a little bit of time brand new state representative seat was created in my home county of Waller County at the time, part of Fort Bend, which is where we call home in Wharton County. So it was a brand new state rep district. 
we didn't have kids at the time. I had a little bit of a gap of time from business that, that had sold. So now I had that opportunity to uh, find something else to do with that little bit of time. And so I ran for the legislature. And this was what year? In 2002. Time flies. So it, it? it's amazing how much it flies. I thought about it in August of this year. It hit me partway through August that 17 years ago this last August was the first time I was in a candidate debate forum environment. Yeah. And I was thinking back, wow, I had no gray hair. Had, uh, had, politics you know, will do politics, that to you. Politics was very different back then, but you know, ran for state representative, won in a runoff election, served there four years. My state senator didn't run for re-election, decided to move across the rotunda, served in the Senate for eight years, and after being in the building for 12, thought, well, now that with the shakeup of statewide offices and have always enjoyed finances, numbers, accounting aspect, even though I'm a lawyer by education, that's the area that I focused on in the business side of it and, and understanding at least how the legislative process works and how critical good data and information is for policy makers, right. I felt like the controller's office was really the best fit for me in an area that I just enjoy the issues we do. Mm -hmm. um, I was having a roundtable discussion earlier with a group of economists that we had brought in that focus on U.S. economy, state economy, housing, oil and gas, very different sector areas. And so we had a big two and a half hour meeting earlier today, just a round table discussion on what they think is going on in those different sectors of the economy, how that translates. Because we're trying to put together the two year revenue estimate that we have to give to the legislature right. as one of our core constitutional responsibilities come January. And, and it's a big deal. And it's a big deal because that sets the field for what the legislature has far as revenues in how they're able to set the budget. And, you know, I mention in speeches all the time how the Texas economy is really remarkable right now. Job gains, I mean, we've had, go back a couple of years ago to uh, January of last session, and the Texas economy grew by, let's say, 170,000 jobs in the prior 12 years, mm. which is a lot. Right. But compare that to the new job data that we got in the last 12 months, Texas had created almost 400,000 jobs. Oh, wow. So the improvement in job count lower unemployment rate, increase in revenue collections because of all the economic activity going on in the state has been phenomenal. Yet I also tell people in every speech I give that the Texas, like the U.S., is in the longest economic recovery in modern history. Hmm. So we've had the longest economic expansion that we've ever had in modern history since the great financial crisis in those seven time period. Right. And so that also scares you that every morning you wake up you're one day closer to the next recession. You know, and the reality is you only know when you're in a recession in hindsight. That's true. It's really hard to forecast right. in an international global economy. And Texas is so intertwined with not just the U.S., but the global economy. And so that's one reason we wanted to have that round discussion. And even though we get, we get all the data that they have, it's just good to sit around a table and talk about a few of the things that maybe we didn't think about. You know, they may not be putting on paper but is dwelling in their mind on what is some of the caution or the optimism that could go in the economy as we're putting that revenue estimate together. Sure. So right now, the Texas economy is doing quite well. Very well. Um, and it sounds like you see it continuing to grow and expand. It, it looks as though it'll continue to grow in the near horizon. And uh, the question is, is when does it slow down mm -hmm. and then for how long? And if you go back to the last recession... Is that inevitable? I mean, it, for, it's gonna for happen. people who don't understand it, economic cycles, it, I mean, it, it, it's it, just going to happen. It, I'll, say it, I'll use it as this example. Uh, if you're driving a car, you eventually got to stop and fill it with gas. Okay. you you got to stop. Right. It's going to run out. And in the economy, you know, whether it was the dot-com bust, you know, over, over inflation rates, values of that, and all of a sudden people go, wait, what's going on here? Or housing prices was so hot, it over got so mm. high, and it had a ripple effect to the rest of the economy. And actually, when we had uh, Texas did not grow in the year 2016 as an economy, even though here in Austin, it grew phenomenally. Or the Metroplex, Dallas-Fort Worth area, just grew phenomenally in 2016. But because we had a significant downturn in oil prices, which impacted the oil industry, impacted manufacturing industry, impacted the agriculture area, which is a large rural portions of the state, obviously is heavily dependent on agriculture. 
the state of Texas for the first time had zero growth that year. Mm. Now, portions of the state grew. Sure. Portions of the state were flat. Portions of the state were in a recession. But we were fortunate then that it didn't ripple effect into the rest of the economy. Because right. the rest of the national economy was still doing pretty well. And so it is inevitable. What goes up has to come down. True. But the question is, is how sharp does it come down? And then how much before the rebound? And, and I would... We're very optimistic that even when we do have a global downturn, national downturn, Texas downturn in the economy, Texas is poised to come out of it a lot stronger than everybody else, right. which is a good thing when you live in Texas. That's right. And the Texas economy today is a much more diverse economy right. than it was 20, 30 years ago. That's right. Uh, you know, back in the 80s when the oil and gas industry uh, took a major downturn, right? The whole economy crashed. Significant downturn. And right. We had major issues in the state for quite some time where this time is very interesting. When I'd get out and talk about during the downturn in the oil prices, which happened to hit that industry in manufacturing, talked about in those two industry sectors alone, Texas lost 160,000 jobs. Mm. But if I was giving that speech in Austin or the Metroplex, people would look around and go, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Right because it did not impact those communities. Right. Or if you go to uh, San Antonio, it had some impact from the, the Eagleford shell, but San Antonio continued to grow. Or take Houston. Houston had really kind of a mild three-month recession, but you've got the medical center, mm -hmm. which employs probably 80,000 people. Right. They go there, work every day. You have the Port of Houston, which is the busiest navigable waterway in the United States. So you have, even in the greater Houston economy, which is the energy hub of the world, energy capital, you have all these other activities that helped balance that out than what we've had in the past, right. exactly. which is good for the overall state economy at that point. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, during that downturn in the 80s, the legislature decided, hey, we have to mm -hmm. have some type of insurance right. uh, against this ha when this happens again. Right. Not if, when, right. as right. you said. And so the legislature created the Economic Stabilization Fund, which we refer to as well, rightly or wrongly, right. the rainy day right. fund, right. right? And I know you have come up with a proposal to uh, reform that in some right. ways and make it serve the state better. So first of all, for our listeners who don't really know what the rainy day fund is, tell us about that, what it is, and then tell us how you want to modify it. Yeah, so let's go back to those 1980s. The Texas had a significant economic uh, downturn because of oil and gas. And as you mentioned, the, oil, the economy was much more dependent on that industry sector than it is today mm -hmm. and not as diverse. So the legislature said, hey, look, we don't want this to ever happen again. Let's propose a constitutional amendment. The voters ultimately approved this constitutional amendment that we would create a state savings account, an economic stabilization fund, or as we call it, a rainy day fund or a state savings account. But the problem was the revenue source was off oil and gas severance taxes. Now, we just said we were in an oil downturn. <laughs> right. And interestingly, at that time period, major international companies were selling all their assets for pennies on the dollar because they said there's really nothing left out here. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to collect. Right. They're just, so we're going to sell out. And so point being is for several years, there was no money coming into it because we were in an oil bust. And right. so it was a great idea. But fast forward several years, get into uh, new technologies, capabilities. You know, now the Permian Basin is not only the most prolific oil field for growth in the U.S. in the world. Mm -hmm. The amazing. U.S. last year had more growth in oil production than pretty much anywhere in the world has ever seen. Right. Pretty phenomenal how that has changed 180 because of technology and capability. So that also means revenue streams into the Treasury off oil and gas severance taxes have now substantially increased. Right. And so back roughly when I got into office, I think that fund had finally moved up to where it had billions of dollars, over $6 billion, which is an enormous amount of money. Right. Now it got to be where there was enough money coming into it that when I was still in the state Senate, we thought, what are we going to do with all this money? Mm -hmm. So let's put part of it towards transportation. Right. So the decision was after you collect uh, let's say $530 million in severance tax for oil, $590 million for natural gas, 25% above those numbers stays in the budget for public education, 75% okay. above that went in the state savings account. But it started saving so much money, we said, how about we just send half of that there, send the other half to road transportation. Mm -hmm. So like last year, I transferred 
Come November of last year, a few months after we closed the fiscal books, I sent $734 million off severance taxes above these two thresholds over into the state savings account and an equal amount over into highway transportation. Okay. This year, when I make that transfer next month, because of the growth, it's going to be almost $1.4 billion oh, wow. to each account, okay. which means let's just focus on the state savings account. Next month, that fund will have not $6 billion, not seven, not eight, nine, ten, or eleven. It'll have $11.9 billion. That's, I think that's a lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money to me. Maybe I mean, not to you, but almost, it is to almost me. Almost a Powerball, almost a Mega Millions. Significant amount of money, but <laughs> the point of coming back to my proposal is that one of the things that we do not do well as a state, and people do not do in general, is where you're looking to what are the long-term costs that we have? Pensions, deferred maintenance and buildings, things that you don't have to pay today, but you got to pay at some point in time. And Bridges. typically they don't get talked about in the building as much because you're trying to put a two-year budget together. And so being that I served over there, I understand that. And then understanding much more clear now in my capacity that when they put the constitutional amendment in place to create the state savings account, no one really thought it'd have any money in it. So why would we worry how we handle the money if it's not going to have much in it? Right. Now we have so much of it, yet constitutionally, statutorily, I'm required for my office to essentially just keep it in ordinary cash. And so I make the example mm. that it's almost like taking $11 billion, now almost $12 billion of money, digging a hole and burying it on the Capitol lawn, right. which that's not very smart. No, it doesn't so make much sense. we have endowments in my office. We have 14 different endowments we oversee. Tobacco settlement dollars is the biggest one of those to where we try to make sure, one, we preserve the corpus of the fund. Mm -hmm. Number two, we try to cover inflation because inflation grows about 2.5% a year. So you want to make sure that it grows over time to right. keep the purchasing power. Right. And then three, try to earn a little bit higher rate of return on those monies through a diversified portfolio. And so my proposal to the legislature is let's keep a certain amount of the state savings account for a true rainy day, right. either Hurricane Harvey expenses for next session because of that disaster or an economic downturn. So let's keep a certain amount. As long as the bucket's full, then let's send the money over into a separate bucket which is I call the legacy fund, that we would actually earn a higher rate of return. Okay. Again, try to preserve the principle of it, cover inflation, and then a little bit higher. And then the returns that we would make, we would send right back to the legislature. And then they would appropriate those to deal with long-term liability issues, such as pensions, deferred maintenance. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you could be spending on other infrastructure projects. And part of that is because it's almost ironic. Texas has the strongest economy in the nation and one of the strongest in the world. Yet, if we don't tend to these long-term liabilities in a few years, we really are at risk to start having downgrades in our credit rating, which is almost hard to even imagine. Right. Now, are we a state like Illinois, Connecticut, New Jersey? No, but I just don't want us to become like that sure. state. And we have a huge amount of money that is not being put to work today. So let's put it to work just right. like businesses do and making sure that then we're able to use that money to solve our long-term problems. Create money out of something that we don't, we're not using today. It's a pretty simple concept. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and it would be, um, it's almost strange that we would let money sit around and, and not right. try to put it to of work. that amount of money. Sure. Absolutely. Now, I mean, I could probably take some of it and spend it, you know. I th I th and the but. legislature could take it and spend it too, but I'm trying to prevent that. I'm right. trying to solve right. real problems with those dollars. So, and, and the legislature understands that we're facing they some do. real cost drivers in the budget, and, and they're not easy things to no, they're not. resolve. They're and, not. and some of them, which, which are mandated spending from, right. from the federal right. government, right. basically, you, can't, you don't have a lot of yeah. ability to change it. So I would think uh, this shouldn't be an easy s or a hard sell for no, you No, it, you know, last session it was a new concept and mm -hmm. it takes people a little bit. I had a speech last night that talked about this issue and some people go, well, I'm, I'm, why would they be against this? And I said, well, one, it's an education level. Sure. That the question is, wait, Glenn Hager, are we going to trust you to invest these monies? No, I, I have an entire team. This is what they are professionals and they do. I oversee them. Right. However, with that, we already do this already with others. And so, you know, it's a learning education because you don't recall what all the controller's office handles and what we do with the treasury. And so once you get everybody comfortable in understanding 
with models, and they're just a model of how you can resolve these problems. It's amazing in the course of this last year since the last session how, how many people in the building are saying, yeah, we, we need to do something different now. And two, when you put in perspective that of all the states in the U.S. that have a source of revenue off oil and gas severance tax, coal severance tax, every state, it was us in Oklahoma, but Oklahoma has passed a constitutional amendment to create this sovereign wealth type fund. Mm. So now Texas is the only one left. And when you look around our brethren across the nation and you go, if they can figure out and do this, right. really Hager's not coming up with a new novel concept. He's just trying to take best practices from other places and make sure we implement them here. Okay. Makes sense to me. Hopefully yeah. it'll make sense to them. They they convene in January of next year. That's what I hear. Uh, yeah. Um, not, not much we can do about it. I think no. the Constitution yeah, yeah, mandates yeah, yeah. it. So <laughs> That's th right. they'll be here. They'll be here. Um, so since you've been comptroller, you've done a lot of things at the agency to right. increase efficiencies, eliminate unnecessary programs, make the agency more mm -hmm. taxpayer friendly. Mm -hmm. Tell us a couple things about that. Yeah, if you look at the overall agents, kind of as I mentioned earlier, we have you know roughly a little less than 3,000 employees, 26 divisions. But if you look at our core constitutional duties, that's the revenue estimating, which we've been talking a little bit about, tax collection. That's also the treasury operation, paying the bills and making sure the dollars that are there, we're, we're making sure we, we keep those dollars safe. So from those three core constitutional duties, all the other responsibilities are important as well. Mm -hmm. However, I've tried to focus significantly on those three. And, and, and more particularly when people say, well, what is your main priority? Customer service. And customer service is to the taxpayers, because that's who we owe our responsibility to, right. to the businesses that we interface with, mm -hmm. because that's where the revenue streams come in, and making sure that all facets of the agency are as customer friendly as we can make them. And we change and move over time. And I'll give for a couple of things, for example, is that just how we send letters to businesses that say, thank you for putting your time and your sweat and your equity online. I looked at the old letters and they were like, okay, we saw you opened up a new business and you owe us some taxes. <laughs> congratulations. Well, yeah, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thanks for creating those jobs. Thanks for putting your time, your sweat and your equity right. on the line. And now so, write us a check. Yeah, now write us a check. And so I thought, okay, um, why don't we say thank you first? Yeah. Because that's what's driving the economy. Right. That's what's jo driving job creation. That's what drives the revenues into the treasury. Mm -hmm. You know, and so make a little more customer friendly and say, we really appreciate what you're doing here. And oh, by the way, you need to set up a tax account too. <laughs> um, you can do it in a more subtle way. And sure. so how do you use the different modes of communication to leverage <laughs> and utilize for customer service? You know, we've changed the way we do the entire website, redesigned everything, and just empowering staff to answer questions. And, and one of the things I've done is I've gone around and traveled around to all my offices across the state, meet the, all the staff who are there, and just you know trying to be much more visible because the job they do is really critical. The interfacing with the taxpayers, sure. with the business community, and, and hoping that through my efforts that raises the morale of the agency, right. which in doing that, is going to provide better customer service. Absolutely. Overall. So you mentioned the website. What is the website address for the agency? Yeah, just uh, just do a web search of Texas Controller or uh, how do you C -O -M spell controller? C O M P T R O L L E R. <laughs> yeah, it's a controller. When I ran okay. for the office uh, four years ago, all my TV ads, I very specifically said controller. Right. Because I felt like if people didn't, if I said controller and they're like, the idiot doesn't even know how to spell what's on the TV. <laughs> right. So uh, I, I, I yeah. specifically made the pronunciation real clear like it's spelled as right. the words are rolling up on the TV screen. Fair enough. Yeah. Now, is your son Jonas still saying Compatroller? He does, okay. yeah, okay. Compatroller. Daddy, okay. how's the Compatroller? He does, he does like a dub, double P yeah, in there. I like that. Now, the website, you've I noticed that you, you've put up a lot of very good educational videos yeah. about different parts of the agency, whether it's the unclaimed property right. uh, program that you all administer to help reconnect people right. with money with they didn't money. know they had. Yeah, here, right? uh, here in the next week or so, I'm going to present a check to someone. And when I do, in the four years I've been in office, that will mark the first time when we have returned officially a billion dollars. Oh, in wow. Unclean in property. totality. In not totality. to this one person. Not to one person. You're, you're not running the no, main No, no, no. We don't okay. we don't have the lotto, okay. but uh 
in totality, that's a significant amount of money that's a lot to of return money. to people in, right. uh, in a little less than four years. And so, yes, we put those videos out, one, to help inform the public of what we do in some of the different divisions, all the divisions about what do we do, what goes on in this division, but also it's helpful for internal purposes. Because as an employee, you may be there five years, 10 there, 15, 20 years, and if you work in one division or two, you don't know what goes on in the other divisions. Sure. So it's also helpful from, from a staffing perspective to be able to watch just a couple of, you know, two minute video to find right. out, oh, this is what my brethren over here, right. actually the important role that they play of making this agency run and operate every day. So it sure. does a dual purpose, one out, outside education and internal education mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Well, so I would encourage everybody, now that I've seen all these videos, go to the Comptroller's yeah. website and watch some of these short videos. You have a YouTube channel that all right. of this is, is funneled That's into. Right. Uh, because it's fascinating and, and you know if you are digging through your couch for some spare change don't do that go to the comptroller's yeah, website right. see if you got some yeah. money that you didn't know you had yeah the, that's unclaimed property is an unbelievable area and so claim it texas.org claim it texas.org which okay. is easy to remember claim sure. it texas.org and do a quick search see if your name's there your family members your friends and i guarantee you between yourself your family and friends you will find someone who has unclaimed property mm -hmm. and it's an sure. easy usually a 60-day process fill out the form and uh, then we send you your check back because it's your money you know right. you you had the easiest example is you live somewhere you put a utility deposit down you mm -hmm. moved you forgot to get your deposit they can't find you after three to five years right so then they send it to the treasury sure and then we list it on the website and you know we're trying to do promotional ways to help make sure people know about it and i talk about it in every community that i go to mm -hmm. and it's pretty amazing i was in nacogdoches yesterday and just talking about that hey you know if all of you live in nacogdoches yep well here in nacogdoches county there's over nine million dollars in unclaimed property oh wow i mean just in nacogdoches county that's amazing nine million dollars so you go to some of our suburban urban areas of some of the very large communities i mean there can be hundreds of millions of dollars you know in 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 a county like Harris or Dallas or Travis County, mm -hmm. a significant amount of money. That's amazing. Yeah. So one other thing I noticed while I was digging through all these videos, I I didn't realize what a good actor you are. Yes, I'm telling yeah. you. Yes. Um, do you have an agent? Do we need to find you an no, agent? No, we're just uh, trying to do it internally because it's all yeah. for free right now. There's okay. no there's no paid acting. I Maybe if you. I move to the big screen, but sure. you know I figured yeah. out Hollywood doesn't have anything in intake for somebody of uh, my my more conservative values. So I figured I better uh, stay stay acting in the agency and not mm. move into the big leagues. Okay, we just need to recreate Hollywood here. Exactly. There you and, go. And, there you and, go. And you can be the first big <laughs> Texas based Hollywood <laughs> actor from here. So I assume it, you're talking about our uh, Christmas. Videos. Yes, yes, yes. I, I digress. But the Christmas videos are absolutely hilarious. They, and, and you've been doing them for a couple of we've, years. We've done them. Every, I've done one every year since I've been in office. Well, the first one we started with was It's a Wonderful Life, uh, which is my favorite movie. Right. So uh, we, we did one around It's a Wonderful Life uh, last year. If I recall correctly, we did one over uh, Home Alone. Yeah, and what was what was that kid's name? What was the actor's name? Macaulay <laughs> Culkin. Yes, yes, yes. So, so do that, do that. Uh, oh, oh, that oh, face I, yeah, for we, me. We, yeah. <laughs> So, so we've, I've got the face going. We had, you know, a little piece of cardboard. Well, hold and we on were a second. Hold on a second. Don't, don't, yeah, don't, don't give don't, it. Okay. No, no spoiler alerts here. Let's let's go ahead and show the video. Okay. Awesome. Of uh, you got last, it? we've got it dialed up. We're going to show last year's Christmas video. Awesome. Where uh, Comptroller Glenn Hager is the star. I guess maybe you're starring as Macaulay Culkin. Yes. I don't even know what his name was yes. in the movie. But at any rate, here's the video. All right. Well, is everybody ready for the off-site meeting? Hey, Mike, let's take the stairs on the way out. Okay, but don't forget, they're pretty steep. Oh, Mike. <laughs> Get down to some serious business. Lisa, you got any twos? Go fish. All right, Johnny, but what about my money? I'm going one, two, ten. 
keep the chain, chain. You, you built, built the animal. animal. This doesn't look too steep. We forgot Glenn. We hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a happy holiday season. Merry Christmas! It's a good video. <laughs> so, um, any thoughts? We are now at the end of October. Any thoughts for the theme for no, now, this year? Now year's? I'm going to have to go back to the team and figure out. They come up. I told them the first year we had to do It's a Wonderful Life because that okay, was my, fa favorite. my favorite sure. movie. And then after that, it, and they come up with all the different scenes, the whole parts of it. Charlie Brown's Christmas tree last year. So I'll have to go back. We'll have to get to work on that today. It is Absolutely. coming up soon and we'll have Absolutely. to shoot that here in the next month. But it's a fun, it's a fun cute thing to do inside sure. the agency the yeah. staff like it so it's something kind of complex well, and we do a food drive around it okay. you know as well and we we have it we send it out to the agency but we also do an open house to where anybody in the agency can come through exec most of those staff i mean you've got staffers that work there 30 years and they've never been in the exec part of the office oh, well. and it's so a it's a big agency it's a big agency yeah. but it's a nice way to welcome the staff in and me to do another one-on-one -on -one with, em with employees as they come through for over across a, a, a few hours over two or three different <coughs> days. And so we'll have TVs playing with the, uh, with the newest video. All right, well, if, if I think of any brilliant ideas, I'll-, I'll You better uh, come up with them soon. I, you know, I think you'd look good as an elf. That would be, you that know, would, that would be. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about the Grinch one day, Grinch depending awesome. on the revenue estimate for Grinch, next session. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Comptroller yes. Ken Hager, we've Good taken to be too with much you of again. your time. Uh, as you know, because you were the first guest on the show, we like to end each episode yeah. with some words of wisdom from our guest, which uh, it can either be a Bible verse, a song lyric, or whatever you have for us. Yeah, you, I'd say you anything you want to share. I'd say uh, really the the most recent one is uh, what Dara and I we were teaching in Sunday school. We we do it twice twice a month for our fourth graders and a uh, thing last week, and this was very relevant to some speeches I had yesterday and people talking about different things, is that you know you just need to be content with what you have in life mm. and uh, not really worrying about what other people have as far as envy mm -hmm. and or jealousy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that you know as Dara and I were trying to impress upon a bunch of 10-year-olds that important lesson in life, uh, we as adults can take some lesson from that too. No and, and especially if you look around the world as it is today or politics in general is sometimes just being content with what you got in life mm -hmm. it, it'll take you a lot further than you can ever begin to appreciate rather than having envy and jealousy for something other people have i mean the pasture is not that green on the other side um, right. it, it looks a little greener from afar so sure. i'd say that'd kind of be my words today and that's something that you know that's one reason uh, we enjoy doing that one with the kids and watching them grow over the years as we move from class to class as they grow but you know, it also helps me refresh things that I should be doing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Not just That's my true. children. Well, as the Bible teaches us, we shouldn't focus on storing up treasures here That's on right. earth. We should be focused on the rewards in heaven yeah, yeah. Uh, after our time here on earth. Yeah. So that'd so, be my words for today. Well, thank you very much. Thank yep. you for sharing. Glad thank to Thank you for coming on the show. And thank you all for watching The Trey Blocker Show. You can find us on your favorite podcast app, YouTube, and at TreyBlockerShow.com. Thank you and God bless. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.